Hey, I'm Michelle. And I'm Sarah. And I'm Aaron. And I'm Matt. And I'm Mark. Today, we're representing the great philosopher John Rawls, and we're going to tell you all about his life from infancy to death in less than 10 minutes. His story began back in 1921 in Baltimore, Maryland, when William Lee and Anna Stump Rawls gave birth to their second son, John Rawls. His father was an attorney, and his mother was a busy woman who eventually had a total of five sons. As if a household of young boys isn't crazy enough, John Rawls brought a whole new exciting element to his family. In his childhood, John Rawls suffered from pneumonia and an illness called diphtheria. Despite his weak lungs, he grew up to be a great orator on philosophy. Rawls eventually healed, but two of his brothers contracted his illnesses and both died, leaving the family with only three sons to carry on the Rawls name. Rawls spent his early education at a preparatory school in Connecticut. After graduating, Rawls left for Princeton where his interest in philosophy began. He achieved a Bachelor of Arts degree and became involved in the Ivy Club. This helped with meeting cute college girls, no doubt. Not long after receiving his bachelor's degree, Rawls enlisted in the war as an infantryman in the Pacific. Here he witnessed the aftermath of the Hiroshima bombing. Rawls was offered a position as an officer in 1946, but he declined and returned to Princeton to receive his doctorate in moral philosophy. In 1949, Rawls settled down with a girl named Margaret Fox, and they began a life of their own. Do you ever get tired of going to school? Well, John Rawls couldn't get enough of it. He got his PhD from Princeton in 1950 and then taught there until 1952. He then received a Fulbright Fellowship to Christ Church at the University of Oxford. While there, he was influenced strongly by two men, liberal political theorist and historian of ideas Isaiah Berlin, and more strongly, the legal theorist H.L.A. Hart. Rawls then returned to the United States where he served first as an assistant and then as an associate professor at Cornell University. In 1962, he became a full professor of philosophy at Cornell and soon ach achieved a tenured position at MIT. That same year, he moved to Harvard University where he taught for almost 40 years and where he trained some of the leading contemporary figures in moral and political philosophy. Pretty impressive, huh? As he grew older, troubles began to beset him he suffered several debilitating strokes starting in 1995, but didn't let that get him down. He was still determined to continue to write essays and voice his concerns, which had now grown to incorporate the international scene. Through the help of his wife and several colleagues, he published many more papers to explain, defend, and revise his Theory of Justice, culminating in a revised edition of Theory of Justice in 1999 and Justice as Fairness, a restatement, in 2001. Rawls received both the Shock Prize for Logic and Philosophy and the National Humanities Medal in 1999. The latter, presented by President Bill Clinton, is an award given to those who deepened the nation's understanding of the humanities, broadened our citizens' engagement with the humanities, or helped preserve and expand America's access to important resources in the humanities. John Rawls had a big impact on philosophy. One of his most influential works was his book, Justice as Fairness. The book outlines what principles are to be found in an ideal, fair, democratic society. Rawls' view is that social justice should protect the liberties, rights, and opportunities of those citizens within the society. He believes that something is fair as long as it promotes equal access to liberties, human rights, healthy and fulfilling lives, and whether or not it benefits the least advantaged members of society. Rawls illustrates a concept he calls the veil of ignorance in which citizens create the outline for their ideal society without knowledge of what their social status, sex, race, or otherwise will be in this society. Rawls understands that even with this ideal outline for society, not all will agree with its principles. Nevertheless, he believes that most members of society will agree on the basic principles of justice, even if they disagree on other religious or philosophical matters. Rawls' theory contains two fundamental principles. First, every person within a society has the same claim to equal basic liberties. Second, social and economic inequalities are okay as long as there exists equal opportunity to attain them and that they are the greatest benefit to the least advantaged members of society. The overall theme of these principles is that equality is the most important factor in society. The first principle applies to the constitutional rights of its citizens while the second applies to the institutions that provide for its citizens. 
Overall, Rawls theory could be used to determine if any process or outcome is consistent with social justice. If it is not consistent, then the basic principles of that society are unfair. Although it may not lead to a perfect society, Rawls believes that if we were to fully apply these principles, we would have the most ideal society possible. Rawls applied his theory of social justice only on a local or national level, as international relations are much more complicated. Rawls believed that countries should be self-sufficient, arguing that economic aid should only be used to help governments protect basic human rights. He was concerned that excessive economic aid would lead to a moral hazard problem. In 1993, Rawls published the essay, The Law of Peoples, which he later expanded to a book in 1999. In The Law of Peoples, Rawls groups all countries into three categories, liberal states, decent states, and outlaw states. He classifies liberal states as those who promote equal rights and do not endorse a specific religion or political philosophy. Decent states may favor one religion and may not be democratic at all. However, they still respect basic human rights. Outlaw states are those who do not respect human rights or who act in an excessively aggressive manner. Rawls argues in favor of a liberal international order, one that promotes the mutual respect of all liberal and decent states. In Rawls' view, this respect should not be extended to outlaw states. Rawls goes so far to say that intervention with outlaw states is justified in certain circumstances. He admits, however, that this should be avoided if possible. So the next time you think about what's fair in society, know that you've probably been influenced by John Rawls. Cool, huh? Now would everyone please pull out a piece of paper and a pencil for a pop quiz on John Rawls? Just kidding, but I'm sure you'd all ace it. This is Group Rawls and we support this message. Mm -hmm.